Welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hurts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so excited that you decided to connect today. Right now, grab something to take notes with as we begin today's message. We're in a series called The Lost Parables, and these are not ancient writings that were lost. Jesus talks about things that have been lost and how the father, how a master goes about restoring those things. This is the third parable in that line that we're going to look at today. And our key text starts right there in Luke 15. Luke 15 lists out these parables and verse 1 says this, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. I mean, what a great model that is. A bunch of people far from God are seeking Jesus to learn about God. I mean, is that not the epitome of what church should be and ministry should be? I mean, this is like evangelism 101, right? It's so funny, like, man, we're going to have evangelist Josh in church today preaching to us. And I'm like, that's an oxymoron. Like, an evangelist shouldn't be in the church, an evangelist should be in the streets, like, we need to go where the unsaved are, right? Not just preaching to saved people about how bad they are. So Jesus is about around these sinners and tax collectors, the worst of the worst. But the Pharisees, but the church people, but the OG Christians, the people who've been in church for 30 years, they muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. How dare this man be around a bunch of infidels, be around these sinners. Like church people are upset that Jesus is evangelizing. It's wild. And so Jesus, he always has to have that smart comeback. He always has to like put it back in their face to let them know like you guys are missing the point. You're missing the point to evangelism. You're missing the point to what it means to be a Christian. And on this Memorial Day weekend, I just kind of want to talk to you about like what you could do tomorrow. What backyard evangelism looks like. What does barbecue evangelism look like? Is that kind of cool? Right? Because I'm not the guy that's going door to door, knocking on doors and trying to sell Jesus to people. It's not my comfort zone. I think there's a place for that. I think people who are called to that should do that. But I'm more about relational evangelism. More about being a light to people and giving encouraging words. And I believe that the Bible says it is the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. It's about being around people who need Jesus and demonstrating his love that will draw them into the kingdom. So before I begin, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for this Memorial Day weekend. Lord, we thank you for those who have served this country and those who have paid the ultimate price. Your word says that no greater love than this than a man laid down his life for a brother. Lord, we thank you for those who have done that for us, for our freedom, for our safety, for our future. Holy Spirit, we ask you as we get into the word today, you would open the eyes of our understanding and lighten us to your truth. Show us things to come in Jesus' name. Amen. And let me ask you this question. Has anybody in here ever lost something important before? Lost something important? Yeah, Pastor Josh is notorious for losing his car keys. It happens about three times a week, and they're exactly where he left them. But, right, but if you don't put them in the same place, or sometimes you put something in a different place, or I'm not going to blame my wife on her birthday. She, she, it's her birthday today, so I'm not going to blame my wife. But you know, I could have something important on the counter right where I know that it was. And I'm like, what did you do with that thing I had right there? I don't know. I never saw it. And I'm like, yeah, right. And then I find in a stack of something, it was moved, right? Come on, somebody. Ah, uh-uh, quiet. It's your birthday. Maybe you misplaced car keys or a cell phone. Or the title to a car, right? You go to sell your car and now you can't find the car title. Or an important bill. Or maybe you purposely threw out the important bill. But this can be like a stressful moment, right? Where you like lost something 
and you're like looking for it, like I had a hundred dollar bill, where did I put that? And now all of a sudden you're kind of stressed out, you're looking all over for it. And a lot of times the thing that you think you lost is actually sitting right in front of you. But because you're stressed out, you get tunnel vision, you can only see like three inches of space, you completely overlook it. And it's not until somebody else who's not stressed out, comes along and is like, that right there? It's right, it's right there, right? This is actually called selective attention. You ever heard of this? It's actually a psychological thing. It happens when we stress. And we have to understand that attention is a limited resource. And I'm seeing that more and more in society today. Is like our attention spans are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, right? Like we've gone from having like these social security numbers that are infinite numbers long to like the passcode on our phone not even being four digits anymore, but we gotta use our face. I can't remember all these passwords. Can't remember all these, this attention span. And what this does is because attention is limited, your, your mind tries to like zone out the unimportant details and tries to focus on what matters, but when you're stressed, it kind of gets all jumbled up. In high pressure moments, our ability to focus on what we need to becomes entangled with the, all the other information going on in our brain. The human brain just is bombarded with data and information all day long. I'm going to give you a tip. Like, if you're in an important meeting or you're working on a project, don't just simply, like, have your phone flipped upside down on the table. Like, don't even have it in the room. Because we're all programmed in here. Or ding. And we have to pick it up and look. Like, there's just this overwhelming need. I've got, I'm going to miss out on what that important message was. And it could just be a reminder to like take your daily laxative. <laughs> but because it was so important and you had to look at it, you pick it up, you look at it. And it can take up to five to ten minutes to get refocused on what you were doing. Now think about all those interruptions all day long. Emails popping up on your screen. Just got to check what sales are happening at Ashley Furniture today. Come on. We generally center our attention on certain important elements of our environment while other things blend into the background. Have you ever been driving your car and all of a sudden like a great song comes on and it triggers a memory and all of a sudden you're in la la land and you just drove 10 miles and you have no memory of driving 10 miles? pass right by your exit, you're still going, you're like, how the heck did I just drive this car because I was not looking at the road, right? Our brains and our minds are so powerful like that. As a kid, maybe this happened in your family, my mom would say, Mike, go to the pantry and get me Dinty more beef stew. Come on, who likes Dinty more beef stew? You know you do that nasty cat food stuff is so good. <laughs> Get, get the Dinty more beef stew. It's on the third shelf next to the Chef Boy RD. <laughs> Nasty food, too. So I get up as a kid, go to the pantry, and I'm looking. Third shelf. Can't see nothing. My like, mom, it's not here. On the third shelf, Dinty more beef stew next to the Chef Boy RD. It's not here. Oh, so she gets up from whatever she was doing, walks into the pantry, kind of annoyed with me. It's right there, exactly where she said it was, but I never saw it, right? I was looking, but I wasn't seeing. And inevitably, my mom would say, make this statement to me. Mike, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. <laughs> if it was a snake, it would have bit you. And I actually had to look that up because I hate that phrase. It's been ingrained in my mind. It actually comes from a poem written by Lewis Jenkins called, If It Was a Snake. Yeah, I never said it to my kids because I just felt abused by 
I hate snakes, I'm afraid of snakes. So if it was a snake, I wouldn't have got the ditty board beef stew either. So Pastor Josh talked about the parable of the lost sheep. Liana talked about the parable of the lost son and we kind of did them out of order. The parable of the lost sheep is the first one in the storyline and the son is the third and this is the second. So we're kind of doing them out of order. The second parable is called the lost coin and it's short. Let's take a look at it in Luke 15 verse 8. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way I tell you that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So let's take a look at this, let's dissect this. It's called exegesis or proper hermeneutics. What does the wording say? What does it mean to us? What's the proper interpretation of what we're looking at? And the first thing that stands out to me is that this parable is about a woman. And you may say, okay, and? I got stories about my mom all day long. Well, in the time frame in which this was being said, women did not hold the same social status as they do today. And to use a female in theology or philosophy, or telling a storyline to these educated people was just kind of out of character. It just was not right with the times. And Jesus was always doing that. Jesus was always attacking the, the pious people and the judgmental religious leaders and creating a community for the marginalized, the outcast, those who did not have a proper place in society, Jesus was always doing this. Women were not as valued in that time as they are today. And Jesus draws attention to this. There's this woman who has 10 silver coins and she loses one. He's depicting a poor peasant woman in the story. She has 10 silver coins and she loses one. One silver coin is equal to a full day's wage, All right? So she has 10 days of wages or a week and a half of income, and she loses one day's worth of wage. Now, I don't know about you, but if I lost an entire day of pay, I'm going to go look for that, huh? It's not like, well, I got nine more, Right? And for us to think, well, what, what's the big deal? She's got nine more. Like it's only 10% of everything she's got. Oh, so 10% is not that much. So we can all tithe. We can all tithe and give away 10% of our income, right? No, because 10% is a big deal. 10% is a big deal. It hurts to lose something like that. This these silver coins could have been a dowry paid for to uh, marry one of the daughters or for her to be married herself. It could be the entire family savings. It could have been money left to her as an inheritance from her husband's death. We, we don't know anything about this woman. We don't know if she's married. We don't know if she has kids. We don't know where the money came from. We just know that this woman has 10 silver coins. She's lost one. It goes on to say this. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Now, when it says the word sweep here, we have like two vernaculars for how we would use the word sweep. Right At the end of the workday, we say to the staff, hey guys, do a quick sweep of the building and make sure all the exterior doors are locked, the lights are shut off, and the thermostats are shut down. We understand that? Take a sweep of the house. Like, we're just gonna go through, make sure everything's nice and neat. That's not what is meant here. This does not mean that she did a sweep of the house and checked the rooms real quick. In the vernacular of what this is saying, 
This is literally meaning that she takes out a broom and sweeps the house. This is kind of strange. Like, the first thing that comes into my mind when I lose something is not, let me go get the vacuum. Right? Let me go get the dust mop. So one, either her house is mad dirty. Right? Could be. Could be that she got piles and she ain't cleaned that house in months. Like some of y'all garages. Right? Ain't cleaned that thing, got a pile of dirt. And so it could just be right there on the floor underneath three inches of dust. Let me clean it up real quick. It could be something like that. Or it could be the... Or it could be like what I think happens in our lives psychologically, emotionally, is that we begin to lose things like joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness. We begin to lose a lot of the aspects of the joy of the, or the fruit of the Holy Spirit because we let some dirt get in our lives. We let some cobwebs start clogging the filters of our spirit lives, who we need to be. And, and, and I'm just going to say, like, when you find yourself in a position in life where you feel like you've lost your joy, you've lost your peace, you've lost your happiness, there might be an area of your life that you need to sweep up. Because inevitably there's something in there trying to clog you up trying to stop you, trying to put you back. And you could search all day long. Let me find the thing that's going to bring me joy. And the Holy Spirit's like, I've been here all the time. I'm just covered in four inches of dust. <laughs> I'm choking. I have allergies. <laughs> she finds a light. says she lights a candle and she sweeps the house, and that's pro- not the sweeping part, but like that's the first thing I'm gonna do if I can't find something. I'm turning every light switch on, do, 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 right? Now they didn't have light switches back then, so they had to light a candle. But man, I'm I'm turning the lights on, and I, I'm gonna say that this is another area like mold and spore and nasty stuff grows in darkness. The Bible says that the word of God is a light. It's a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. And in your life, when you see like anger is rising and your joy is dropping and your peace is dropping, you might need to light yourself up with some of the word of God. You might need to floodlight, bring a flood. We were, we were on a job a few weeks ago down in Florida and um, we got to a spot where we had to cut a piece of the floor out and it was like getting late at night and they had ripped all the lights out of the building. And we were trying to use power tools and saws with a little tiny work light. I mean, it was not like a big, huge halogen. Could light. I mean, it could literally light up about three feet of workspace at a time. Do you know how hard it is to like do really good work with like a flashlight? It's hard, right? When, when something's happening in your life, it's not like, well, I'll read a, a quick little two-second devotional, and that's going to bring me my joy. Or I'll listen to something on the radio, and maybe that'll bring me my joy. No. When, if you have something going on in your life where the kingdom of darkness is trying to attack you, you need floodlights. You need halogen lights. You need high-intensity distribution lights to flood that, and the word of God is that light. The word of God brings truth to the lies of the devil, and where there's one light, it dispels all darkness. The Bible says in the book of John chapter 1 that the darkness could not extinguish the light. Darkness can never extinguish light, but light always extinguishes the darkness. When something is lost, it has fallen into darkness. It's fallen into darkness because you can't see it. You need to turn the lights on, then start sweeping. 
Sometimes things in your life need to be cleaned up in order for you to find the misplaced blessings of God that you already have. Every single one of us have the blessings of God. And just, you know, it's just crazy sometimes how angry people get that they don't see the blessings of God in their life. When's God going to bless me? When is this Christian thing going to start working? I'm so tired of trying so hard and it's just not working. You're dirty. (laughs) Like your mind is dirty. You're still trying to do things in your carnality instead of operating in the spirit. The Bible says this, those who walk after the spirit shall not satisfy the desires of the flesh. But those who walk after the flesh of the flesh reap corruption. Right? We keep saying, God, where's the blessings? You have them. You're just so dirty you don't see them. You're being carnally minded, which leads to death. But if you allow yourself to be spiritually minded, it leads to life and peace. Right? Sometimes you just need to sweep it up. Sometimes you need a Mr. Clean Eraser. Some parts of your heart. Yo, that thing is magic, yo. If you've never used a Mr. Clean Eraser, you're missing out on life itself. Like, you don't even need spray. You take that thing to your bathtub, all that nasty dead skin. Hey, you get what I'm saying? Some of you has it. Well, Pastor Mike, didn't Jesus wash our hearts clean at salvation? Absolutely. Absolutely. But what he didn't do was brainwash you. You have every single memory that's ever gone through your brain from the time you were born. And that's your job. It is our job to renew our minds daily to the word of God. Renew our minds daily to the light of the truth of the gospel. That is a daily task. See, it can be so easy. The Bible says that many do not live in the blessings of God because their conscience, you know what a conscience is? Their conscience has been seared like a hot iron. It is possible to have wrong beliefs within you based on the way you were raised. And did you know that a wrong belief will convict you inside and make you feel bad just as much as a right belief? The Bible talks about it. So there's some areas in our lives where we have wrong doctrine. We have wrong teaching that needs the Mr. Clean Eraser of the truth of the gospel. That we can live joy. And that's what these people had. These are Pharisees. These are teachers of the law. And their consciences are seared as a hot iron. They have wrong doctrine. They have wrong teaching. And they're not, they're so dirty. It's like they're washed on the outside, but they're dirty on the inside. They're so dirty that they cannot see the Messiah standing in front of them. The thing that they're looking for, the coin, not just a day's wage, not 10 days wages, we're talking of the wages of eternity is standing in front of them and they can't find it. This is what he's saying to them. I'm right here. I'm the coin you've been looking for. I'm the million dollar investment that you need to change your life. I'm right here and you're dirty inside. You need some sweeping inside because you can't see it. And look what it says here. And when she finds it, does she not call her friends and neighbors together and say, rejoice with me. I have found a coin. Now we have to, we have to look carefully at this. It says rejoice with me. It doesn't say, come over my house and rejoice me. Okay, where are you going with that? Like we confuse this a lot of times. It's 
hard for us sometimes to celebrate other people's wins when we feel like we haven't arrived. Well, I don't want to go over there and celebrate their 45th birthday. No one came and celebrated my 45th birthday. Right? So we get this confused where it's like we think that we have to celebrate you instead of celebrating with you. To come celebrate with me that lives can be changed. Come with, celebrate with me. And this is what is going to be happening in eternity. Does not all the angels worship and celebrate together with each other when one person is found and comes to repentance? It was an invitation to celebrate something that they put no real work in doing. All she had to do is find what was hers. She didn't have to meditate and pray. She didn't have to fast and pray. It was already hers. She didn't have to go earn another silver coin. It was hers. And it's so funny, like, we miss this step in our own salvation. We think because we got dirty or we messed up or we fell short of God's glory, well, I got to go earn God's grace again. I got to go earn right standing with God again. I got to go earn salvation all over again. No, she didn't have to earn what was already hers. You don't have to earn the forgiveness of God. It's already yours as a believer. I love what the psalmist David said. He's, he's crying out one day because he's in one of those bad places. He says, Lord, return unto me the joy of my salvation and renew a right spirit in me. It was already his. The joy of salvation was his. The right spirit was already his. But he's like, I need help getting there. I need help clean, cleaning this up and finding that place. All of heaven and the entire body of Christ gets to be part of rejoicing the lost things that are put, brought back to their proper place. All creation is the Lord's. All humanity is the Lord's. But not all humanity has found the Lord. Many are lost. Many are far from God. And I know that this Memorial Day weekend, it's all about the backyard barbecue. It's all about being in the swimming pool. It's all about having a good time. I just, I just want to throw something out there that, that maybe if your neighbor comes over or maybe there is an unsaved family member, that in your celebration, that in your fun, you let the light of the gospel transmit your body. That you allow yourself to operate in the joy. It's oh, operate in the joy of the Lord. It's so easy when you're hosting to get all stressed out and get all nasty. Right? It's like, how come no one wants to come over to my barbecue? Because they know every time you barbecue, you get stressed out. Right? You get all nasty, and no one wants to be around that. But wonder if your house was an oasis of peace. Wonder if your barbecue was an uplifting time where people were laughing, belly laughs, and having a great time. Could you not transmit the love of Jesus Christ? Plant a seed? Maybe pray right before you eat your hot dogs and hamburgers. Like, hey, just in our house, we pray over our meals. This could take one second. That would be weird and religious. Oh, Father God, maker of heaven and the earth, bestow upon us the blessings of these wieners and dogs. <laughs> Just a quick blessing. Be like, dude, I didn't know that you were like a religious person. Well, I'm not really religious, but I do have faith. And I believe in putting God in the center of what we're doing. So we're just going to pray over the food. That's all. Don't be weird, right? Be an example, be a light. Our calling in this life is to be the opposite of the scribes and Pharisees. We are not to pick and choose who we think is worthy of saving. It's not up to us to pick and choose who we think is worthy of salvation. 
who we think has lived a good enough life that they deserve salvation. That's not your choice. The word of God says if Jesus be lifted up, he would draw all men unto him. If you would lift him up in your life, people would be drawn to you. Well, I don't want anybody drawn to me. You wanted a wife. You wanted a husband. You wanted somebody drawn to you. Right? Every single one of us. And I, and I know that there's some people who are insecure and introverts and like, well, you know, I'm not really an outgoing person and I don't know how to share my faith. You don't have to share your faith. And I was like, wait a second, what? Acts 1.8 doesn't say that he was going to input into you all the answers to everybody's question that you were going to be a genius. It says, and you shall be a witness when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit upon you and in your life just makes you a witness. It doesn't make you intelligent. Your life becomes a witness. Your example becomes a witness. The fruit of the Holy Spirit manifests in your life is the witness. But if you're just as nasty and vulgar and obscene and horrible as everybody else, then you're not being a good witness. That, that's just the truth of the matter, right? She says, come rejoice with me. I have found the thing that I lost. Well, Pastor Mike, I don't like the certain group of people in our society. Those people are going to hell. Maybe, maybe you are too. Maybe you are too, right? Man, there's a scary verse in the Bible. And I'm just kind of talking to maybe somebody has a Pharisee heart. That's the only reason I'm taking this slant today. The Bible says that there's a day we go to heaven and that there's gonna be some people that stand before God and they're like, yo, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. I prophesied in your name. I cast out demons in your name. I did workers of, works of miracles in your name. He'll say, yeah, good job, thank you. But depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. So it is possible to have the right lingo. It is possible to use the name of Jesus. It is possible to see miracles happen through your hands, but you not know Jesus. See, the word will never return void. God used a donkey. He used an ass. He could use you. He could use an unsaved person. He spoke through a burning bush. The, the Bible says, if my people will not praise me, even the rocks and the trees will cry. He'll use nature to make his point and to get it across. I just want to make sure that we don't have a false sense of security in eternity. Because we prayed a prayer of salvation, that all is good. If the fruit of the Holy Spirit is not manifest in your life, if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, there might be some layers and layers of dirt in your heart that need cleaning up. The Bible says a man cannot say, I hate my neighbor and I love God. Can't happen. The Bible says it, not me. I'm just throwing this out there today. That, that, if, that if you have that Pharisee spirit in your heart, that judgmental spirit, how can that person be doing that? Especially in our political climate, election coming. How can those people do that? Shut up. Check your heart. Check your heart. The Bible says this, a soft answer turns away wrath. A soft answer turns away wrath. Well, Pastor Mike, I tried that. I tried giving a soft answer back, and it did not stop them from being angry at me. No, 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 you got it all wrong. It does not say a soft answer turns away their wrath. 
a soft answer turns away your wrath. The Bible is not about changing other people. The Bible is about changing you. Backyard evangelism. You didn't think it was going to look like that, did you? But there are people who are lost that need a savior. There are people who are searching who need an example. Write that down. There are the lost who are searching a savior. And there are others looking to need a leader, an example, to show them the way, the truth, and the life. In the same way I tell you, said this, there is rejoicing in the presence of all the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Over one sinner who repents. Listen, there's no classification tied to that. This does not say that all of heaven rejoices when one man comes to salvation. It doesn't say all of heaven rejoices when one white person comes salvation. Because when it comes to eternity and sin, we're all the same. We're all the same. Sinner or saint. Sinner or saint. It's a leveled playing field. And all of heaven rejoices when one sinner repents. Anytime one person turns their faith towards heaven, all of heaven rejoices. And so let me ask this question. Why would we stand in heaven's way? Why would we stand in heaven's way? Wednesday night, someone asked me a question about, you know, who can go to heaven, who can't go to heaven, people who have unconfessed sin, live in lifestyles of sin, all these other things. And so I just asked the whole class, I had about 85 people. I said, how many of you in this entire room have ever led anybody to Jesus? And the whole room got quiet. So we're real quick to judge who can't go, but over half the room have never even offered it to one person. One person. Do you believe the product that you have? Do you believe in the product that you're banking all eternity on? Because me, like, if I watch a really good movie, the next day I come into work, I sell like 10 movie tickets, and I don't even get compensated. I'm like, yo, you got to go see the next Dune. Dune 2 is fire. You got to go see it. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go see it this weekend. Get no credit for it. The Bible says that when I share my faith in Jesus, there's stored treasures in heaven for all eternity. That heaven compensates you for sharing your faith. It's like, eh, maybe if you gave me like 100,000 cash today, if I shared my faith, I might go do it. Yep, we missed the point. And that's what was happening in this story. That's what was happening right here, and that's why Jesus kind of came at them so forcefully. He's like, by virtue of time, you ought to be ready to see what is in front of you, and we're still not seeing the miracle of salvation. Show others a better way. Show them a new and living way. Sweep up your own house. Turn on your own lights. And let the light shine through you, the gospel of Jesus Christ. I would love to hear some reports this week if you were able to share your faith or be a light, in a weird way, be a light to your family, friends, and neighbors that you celebrate tomorrow with and see what that does to you. When you share your faith and someone believes, there is a fire that is lit on the inside of you. The joy of your salvation is renewed. A right spirit is awakened inside of you just by sharing your faith. If you're here today or you're watching online and you yourself have never had the opportunity 
to have the Holy Spirit come and live on the inside of you and bring his fruit with you. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, we'd love to offer that to you today in no weird way or an embarrassing way. We'd love to pray this salvation prayer with you. It goes like this, dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. My name is Pastor John Mark, and I'm so glad we were able to connect together today. If this impacted you in any way, I need you to do a few things for me. I need you to like and subscribe to this channel and head over to FamilyChurchNY.com to take your next steps.